time. So today, uh, welcome to our second session um, of the speaker series on technology and human flourishing in a technological world. Today, our speaker is uh, a very grateful to have John, Dr. Professor John Baer, uh, who's currently the chair, the Regis Chair in Humanity at the University of Aberdeen. And um, I probably don't need to introduce him uh, to most of you. Let me just say quickly um, that John is um, the, one of the most important voices or patristic scholars uh, worldwide and uh, certainly in English speaking, in English speaking world. He's um, written very important works, a critical edition of Origin uh, recently, uh, a book on John theological commentary uh, and much more on, on John. Um, and I promised John to keep the introduction very short, but I'm really grateful to have uh, such an expert to tie together for us and to give us some pointers from the patristic era forward into the world that we live in, the world uh, dominated or, you know, suffused by technology and what it means to be human. So John, uh, without further ado, I wanna give you the floor and uh, invite us to give us your lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jens. It's great to be with you and thank you everybody for coming and I look forward to discussion after all of this. So <clears throat> there's no doubt about it. We've witnessed many epochal changes over the past few centuries. Industrialization, urbanization, globalization, leading to a threatening global cataclysm. And yet in the midst of all these changes, it sometimes passes us by that we too have changed. And that perhaps we're not even the very same being, beings as were our ancestors. Herve Jouvin, in his fascinating study called The Coming of the Body, originally in French and in English, um, he sketches out many of the ways in which science and medicine have redefined what it is to be human, and especially embodied. He argues, our bodies are now plastic. They no longer smell. We have soap and deodorants in a way that people didn't have readily before. Our bodies can be sculpted, more or less, into whatever form we like. Most of us, he points out, no longer know what it is to feel physically tired after a long, hard day of work. But instead, we have to make time from our sedentary lifestyle. We have to make time for exercise. We live longer. We grow older than ever before. And yet we are ever more obsessed by youth and looking young. And we confidently expect that when our bodies malfunction, they can be repaired. So after surveying all of these and other changes, the very last line of his book is rather startling. He says in the very last line, he says, alone the body remembers that it is finite. Alone it roots us in its limits. Our last frontier for how long? And even if, especially if it forgets, the body alone still prevents us from being God to ourselves and to others. That's the last line of his book. Appearing about the same time as Herve Jouvin's book was Geoffrey Bishop's book called The Anticipatory Corpse, Medicine, Power and the Care of the Dying. In it, he analyzes the basis upon which the remarkable developments in medicine were based. He demonstrates how, based as it is upon the dissection of cadavers, dead bodies, the epistemologically normative body for modern medicine is in fact the corpse, hence the title, The Anticipatory Corpse. In an essay written a little bit later, he puts it this way. Under this epistemologically normative dead body, medicine's metaphysical stance has become one in which material and efficient causes are elevated, while formal and final causes are deflated. Put differently, the meaning and purpose of the body is deflated, and the medical, as I say, the mechanical function of the body is elevated. The body is merely dead matter in motion. 
And if its healthy functioning organs are not donated when they're no longer useful to the patient, then that body is ordered to no good. So the good, the telos of the body, the human being as seen by medicine, which is based upon the dissection of dead bodies, the good, the telos of the body, is the right mechanical function of the parts of the body, either in itself, or if it's too late for that, then in others. And then that leads us into a whole quagmire of bioethical problems, especially when, as now is suggested, we should regard brain death as being merely a euphemism and a legal fiction so that organ donation could be practiced prior to the declaration of death. Such developments have changed our understanding of sickness and indeed the relationship between life and death. Sicknesses are now something uniquely physiological, independent of the afflicted person, so that rather than treating the patient, and remember, the patient means the one who suffers, physicians today treat or cure the illness or the afflicted organ through ever more sophisticated and abstract technical procedures, thereby depersonalizing medical therapy, isolating the patient from the disease with which they are afflicted or the disease which they have as something other than themselves. And this in turn, and paradoxically, means that the patient is not now treated. The illness is attacked, the diseased organ is singled out and worked upon, but there's no attempt to help the patient understand or find meaning in their suffering. It's not the patient as a suffering one who's treated, but the disease which is attacked, while the patient suffers the treatment of modern medicine, hoping thereby to find healing, relief, and ultimately to regain life. So all that is left to the patient is to turn to the physician in whose hands their fate resides. So the physician has come to be, as Michel Foucault put it, the priest of modern times the one who can save life, the one who has power over life and death. But the only life which medicine can offer is that of the perpetuation of the biological functioning of the body, dead matter in motion. As to what life itself actually is, let alone human life, modern science has got no answer. And so modern medicine, and its practitioners are at an impasse when faced with death. So much like Herve Jouvin, Jeffrey Bishop also ends his book with a really thought-provoking line. He says, might it not be that only theology can save medicine? But we don't know, but don't we know what life is? Aren't we in fact already living? And yet, as um, the French philosopher Michel Henri points out in his book, I Am the Truth, when we begin to think about what it is that we are talking about when we talk about life, we will find it surprisingly evanescent. It always recedes and disappears from our sight. If we focus on that which we can see, looking at things as they show themselves in the world, we don't, in fact, see life. We can look at living beings, we can look at living organisms, but we don't actually see the life in them. If we try to do so, we end up examining things that appear, neurons, electrical currents, amino acids, cells, chemical properties, all of the things with which biology deals, everything apart from life. As he puts it, Life never shows itself in the world. We see living beings, but never their life. With our attention focused on things as they appear in the world, life simply becomes then the lowest common denominator, applying not only to human beings, but as he puts it, also to protozoa and bees. As if, he objects, as if protozoa and bees can tell us what life is. If we want to say that, yes, indeed, protozoa and bees are living beings, but that human beings are more than that, 
then perhaps we might follow a tradition that goes back to the beginning of human thought about such things, that human beings are more than living beings, that human beings are living endowed with logos, with reason, with language. Today we would no doubt add that human beings are living beings endowed with creativity or the ability to be in relationship, in communion. And we would say that a flourishing human life means enjoyment of all of this and more. But if we take that path in defining what life is as a lowest common denominator for all living beings, and also say that human beings are more than simple living human beings, having the further dignity of all those things in which we pride ourselves, then we would also have to say that life is less than human. Or even stronger, we'd actually have to say life is inhuman. So <clears throat> such th symptoms, life lived in a plastic body, as, Her as Herve Juvin puts it. The reduction of the life we live to the inhuman, as Michel Henry observes. The separation of the disease from the patient, whose suffering now is not addressed, while the sickness with which they suffer is isolated, repaired, or removed, or replaced, as Jeffrey Bishop points out with modern science, med medicine. All of these combine with one further change, one further modification, which is perhaps the most radical change of the past century, and that is the denial of death, which, of course, um, Ernest Becker pointed out in his classic work, The Denial of Death, the erasure of the visibility of the process of dying, the dead person, and death itself. Really breaking with the whole of human history to this point, most of us in the West no longer see death today. And by that I specifically mean those of us in the West, and even then it's a particular privileged part of the West, and I mean specifically the whole liturgy of death caring for our dying, for our loved ones as they die, caring for them at home, laying out their bodies, washing them, preparing them, keeping wake over them with friends and neighbours before we take them to church, commend them to God, give them the last kiss and entrust them to the earth. That whole liturgy of death. Today this whole cycle is handed over to, the, to others, to the death professionals, the morticians, to the point that increasingly now, there is no funeral service, let alone an open coffin. Rather, after the corpse has been disposed of in some kind of crematorium where people increasingly do not go, we have a memorial service at a mutually convenient time at which the person and their life are celebrated without them being bodily present. So we no longer see death today. We don't live with death as an ever-present reality, as has every generation of human beings before us. We can speak more about that coming to discussion. The changes that Herve Juvin and Jeffrey Bishop map. Can we, uh, Mark, I think your microphone's on. He's been muted, sorry. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the changes that Herve Juvin and Jeffrey Bishop map are indeed radical, but the tension towards which they point is one that goes right to the heart of Western culture, it seems, from the beginning. <clears throat> Martha Nussbaum, in her essay Transcending Humanity, explores the way in which it is, it's exemplified in the choice that Odysseus has to make between remaining with Calypso to live the untroubled immortal life of a god with a god, and so transcend his human nature, or returning instead to Penelope, to live as a human in human society, with all the vulnerability, tribulation, and certainty of death that this entails. So what is it, Martha Nussbaum asks, what is it then that gives value, or what value is there, in weakness, suffering, and ultimately death? Martha Nussbaum accepts that choosing the life of a god is indeed a desirable and intelligible choice. Because after all, if you choose the life of a god, one of the Homeric gods, 
Such a life doesn't suffer from any of the constraints that make human life transitory, limited, precarious, and often miserable. Moreover, alongside that negative motivation, there's also the positive motivation of transcendence itself, traced in Greek philosophical tradition, going at least as far back as Xenophanes. The, the ideal activity for a divine being is thinking. To the extent that we approximate to that, we begin to live a divine life. But we know Odysseus chose to return to his mortal bride rather than stay with Calypso. To have remained with Calypso would have brought his story to an end. He would no longer have the opportunity to demonstrate those virtues and achievements which are characteristically human, nor indeed be truly in love, because as she points out, when the gods, when the Greek gods fall in love, it is with mortal human beings. In another work of her called The Fragility of Goodness, she shows how the Greek poets understood the fact, as she put it, that the that part of the peculiar beauty of human excellence just is its vulnerability. Human beings are not gods, neither the transcendently anthropomorphized Olympians, nor are they purely an intellectual divinity in the philosophical tradition. So the truly good life for human beings is not the immortal life of the Olympians, nor ultimately one of contemplation, which is a good activity when subordinated to what is properly human. Rather, the good life for a human being is one that recognizes and accepts the full range of values. She finds that in Aristotle. Aristotle. She puts it, their nature and their goodness are constituted by the fragile nature of human life. Like a delicate plant, it's beautiful precisely because it's fragile. Although her work's not concerned with Christian theology, the centrality of this insight is central to Christianity. And she recognizes that in passing. So going back to her essay, Transcending Humanity, she says, for Christianity seems to grant that in order to imagine a God who is truly superior, truly worthy of worship, truly and fully just, we must imagine a God who is human as well as divine, a God who has actually lived out the non-transcendent life and understands it in the only way that it can be understood by suffering and death. So the life and death of Christ within this world not only endorses the value of the human situation, but actually refocuses and holds our attention on the world in which we actually live. What is involved here is more than the thought experiment, which would conclude that a, a perfect being would perform intellectual contemplation. And what is only imagined here, Christianity seems to grant, in order to imagine a God who's truly superior, we must imagine a God who's human as well. What's only imagined by Martha Nussbaum is in fact the key conviction for Christian theology. That through a death, witnessing to Christ, Christians attain to the full status of being human, a son or daughter of God in the crucified and risen Son of God. So all of that by way of a preamble, um, addressing our current situation, taking our lead from Martha Nussbaum to see what's at stake in all of this. I'm going to give a couple of examples from early Christianity which speak like this and then draw some conclusions from it. The first one I want to look at is Ignatius of Antioch. And where's it? there we go. He's being taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. He meets various Christian communities. He writes letters to them. And then he writes a letter to the Romans before he gets to Rome, telling the Christians in Rome, whatever they do, they shouldn't interfere with his coming martyrdom. Okay. So he says, it's better for me to die in Christ Jesus and to be king over the ends of the earth. I seek him who died for our sake. I desire him who rose for us. Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren, that suffer in the sense of let this happen. Allow it to be so. Allow me, my brethren, hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. 
suffer, allow me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. I shall be a human being. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. So he's not yet born. Birth pangs are upon him. He's not yet living. Hinder me not from living by trying to keep me from going to my martyrdom. Do not wish me to die by trying to keep me alive in this so-called life. He's not yet born. He's not yet living. And he's not yet human. He will only be born into life as a human being by following the example of the passion of my God, willingly suffering death in confession of Christ, the Christ who is willing to embrace the cross, to show us the free self-sacrificial love that is the life of God, that is God. Only in this way does Ignatius hope to become a human being. He denies in one stroke all the things that we unreflectively or instinctively think about ourselves, that we have been born into life and that we are human. No, none of that, that will happen for his martyrdom. In my recent book on the Gospel of John, I argue that the background for Ignatius's words lie in the interplay between Genesis and the Gospel of John, an interplay which is already evident in their opening words, in the beginning, in the beginning. John's telling us that he's playing with Genesis in his presentation of Christ. So, going back to Genesis, Genesis 1, God speaks everything into existence. He says, let it be. Let there be light, let there be a firmament, let the waters be gathered, let there be, let there be this, that, and the other. It is, it's good, end of the day, next day, he speaks more things into existence. Having spoken everything into existence by this divine command, this divine imperative, let there be, having done all of that, he announces the only thing which is said to be his own, his own purpose and project. Let us make the human being in our image. It's introduced not with an imperative, but with a subjunctive. Not let there be a human being, but let us make a human being. It's his purpose and his project. He's spoken everything else into existence as, if you like, the backdrop on the stage. And now he begins his own particular project to make a human being. And this work, I argue, in the Gospel of John, we could talk more about this later, is not complete until, again, only in the Gospel of John, Christ goes to the cross and says, as his last words from the cross, it is finished, to tell this day, or more accurately, it's been brought to perfection, it's completed, it's perfected, just before which Pilate announces, and again, only in the Gospel of John, behold the human being. So read that way, and it seems to be that Ignatius and others are reading it that way, scripture begins with God announcing his project, let us make a human being, and it finishes, it's brought to completion, it's brought to perfection with Christ himself saying, not my will but thine, let it be, here is the true human being. And then Ignatius himself, following the passion of my God, passion of his God, going to his martyrdom, taking up the cross, seeing that as a birth into life as a human being. So for early Christian theology, Christ is the first human being. And therefore, Adam is but a type of the one to come. As Paul puts it, Adam is a type of the one to come. The word type primarily means um, an imprint. Imagine a seal and wax, you stamp the wax, you get an imprint, that is a type, this is a prototype. So Adam's a type of the one to come. The one to come is yet to come, but actually, from God's point of view, Christ is already there. Um, the, the, the prototype has to exist before the stamp. Okay? So even if Adam's a type of the one to come, Christ is already the reality of whom Adam is but a type. So as Nicholas Cabasilas puts it at the end of the 14th century, it's not the old Adam who was a model for the new, but the new Adam for the old. Because of its nature, the old Adam might be considered the archetype for those who see him first, 
you know, we come into existence knowing Adam and we come to Christ. But he continues, for him who has everything before his eyes, the older is the imitation of the second. The older is the imitation of the second. So for Christian theology then, Christ is not simply, as Martha Nussbaum put, said, a God who is human as well as divine. One can actually be more specific. The crucified and risen Christ defines for us what it is to be God and what it is to be human. As Chalcedon puts it, perfect in his divinity, perfect in his humanity. And he does so together in one. Again, as Chalcedon puts it, one pros upon one, one hypostasis. One could put it even more forcefully. Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being, in his totally free laying down of his life in an act of love for others, as it's depicted in the Gospel of John, thereby showing us what it is to be human. So in the light of this, our existence and indeed, our so-called life appears rather differently. We've come into the world with no choice in our own part. As Dostoevsky puts it in The, the Demons, in the character of Kirillov, nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. We had no choice about the matter. We think we're free, but we had no choice about the matter. We're thrown into existence, an existence in which whatever I do, whether we like it or not, we die. Culminates in death. As a given fact, our existence is characterized from the beginning by necessity and mortality. In fact, we are as good as dead from the beginning. And that's why Christ says in the Gospel of John, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Evidently, it's something which we do not yet have. I've come that you might have life. Moreover, as the epistle to the Hebrews puts it, it is the fear of death which has held us in lifelong bondage as we try to hold on to our so-called life. As Christ says, if you try to preserve your life, you'll lose it, no doubt about it. But, he continues, if you lose it for my sake, for the neighbor, for the kingdom, for all the things you can say, you gain it. So through his passion, Christ has destroyed death not in the sense of eradicating it, we still die after all, but he's destroyed it by turning it inside out so that instead of being the end, it becomes the means of life. Death is the last enemy to be conquered, but it's con conquered by death, so death is also the means of victory. Or as Maximus puts it, Christ has converted the use of death so that the baptized acquires the use of death to condemn sin, which in turn mystically leads that person to divine and unending life. Or again, as he puts it, death, once it has ceased having pleasure as its birth mother, the pleasure for which death itself became the natural punishment, death clearly becomes the father of everlasting life. So by voluntarily laying down his life as an act of love, for which he is loved by God, for this reason the Father loves me, that I lay down my life, Christ says, Christ has changed the use of death. So that rather than being the end, it's now the beginning of a life, of a life which cannot be touched by death, because it's been entered into through death. Another way of putting it would be the way Paul does in Corinthians 15. Adam is animated by a breath, a breath which by definition expires, we try to hold on to our breath, but it will expire. Um, whereas Christ, on the other hand, is, brings about the life-giving spirit. So having come into existence passively, with no choice on our part, in necessity and mortality, we now have the possibility, in Christ and by Christ, of voluntarily and actively being born into life, a life which is lived as self-offering love, the life and love that is a very being of God. And in so doing, we become, in Ignatius's words, a human being. Remember, the only work which is said to be God's own work 
let us make a human being in our image and likeness, we are the ones who have to say, let it be. In fact, you could put it even stronger than that. One could say that if to be human is to live by, by um, living in this self-offering love, self-sacrificial love, then God could not have said, let there be a human being because it wouldn't be a voluntary self-offering of love. So um, that's from Ignatius. A couple more examples from Blandina, first of all. Blandina, um, this letter of the Church of Vienna, Leon to Asian figure, written after a great persecution in, in Gaul in the year 177, probably written by Irenaeus, preserved by Eusebius in HE stands for Historia Ecclesiastica. Um, it's a fairly long graphic description of the tortures that they underwent. The heroine of the whole thing is Blandina, a young slave girl. As a young slave girl, she would have been a non-person in Christian in, in antiquity. She would have been a, um, a human non habens personum, no status in society, the lowest of the low, the weakest of the weak, not having a person. So she's able to exemplify the paradox of Christ's words to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So it, it describes here in section 18 of the letter, while we all trembled in her earthly mistress, her earthly mistress is also a Christian, but she's not named, who was herself one of the witnesses, the martyrs, we feared that on account of the weakness of her body, she would be unable to make bold confession. While we feared that, Blandina was filled with such power as to be delivered and raised above those who were torturing her by turns from morning till evening in every manner, so that they acknowledged that they were conquered, could do nothing more to her. They were astonished at her endurance, as her entire body was mangled and broken, and they testified that one of these forms of life, one of these forms of torture was sufficient to destroy life, not to speak of so many and so great sufferings. So, the weakest of the weak, but she's filled with divine power, so that those who were torturing her, they were beaten. It then carries on. This is now paragraph 41. So you can see 30 paragraphs or so of descriptions of torture that go on in between. It's a long, gruesome description. Finally, it culminates with her being suspended upon a stake, upon the wood. The allusion to the cross is, allusion to the cross is pretty clear. Suspended on a stake, exposed to be devoured by the wild beasts who should attack her, and by being seen hanging in the form of a cross. By her earnest prayers, she inspired great zeal in those struggling, the other Christians in the arena. For while struggling, they saw with their outward eyes through the sister, the one who was crucified for them, that he might persuade those who believe in him that all who suffer for Christ's sake will have eternal communion with the living God. It's a really, really fascinating description. And there's several points which, which need to be clearly noted about it. <coughs> Firstly, it is those who are struggling alongside her in the arena that see her as the very embodiment of Christ. So not only is she uh, the weakest of the weak being filled with divine power, she now actually becomes the very embodiment of Christ. They look at her and with her outward eyes, they see the one who suffered for her. It's really continuing incarnation. Just as the disciples only know Christ through his exodus from this world, through his passage out of this world to the Father. That's when they finally know who he is. One can say that he returns in those who follow him in this exodus, so that she is the very embodiment of Christ himself. The second point is that this is only seen by those who are uh, in the arena with her. To see her as the embodiment of Christ, you've got to be in the arena. If you're sitting as a good Roman citizen on the seats of the amphitheater, enjoying a nice day out for the games, taking pictures with your, or, or videos with your cell phone of what's going on, all you would see is a brutality of a gruesome scene in which a young girl gets torn apart by the animals. To see her as the embodiment of Christ, you've got to be in the arena alongside her. It's not, in other words, something that appears in the horizon of the world. 
Just like Michel Henri points out, life does not appear in the horizon of the world. Life, he argues, only appears in the pathos of life. Okay, the third point to note about this is, of course, that it's a written text. And so, in fact, it's Irenaeus who sees this. Irenaeus, who with his theological understanding, he's able to look at the scene of obscene barbarity and ugly violence and see not only trials and tribulations in, that will be rewarded later on with future rewards, but see in this scene the incarnation of Christ in the present. So he's able, if you like, to theologize what he sees, have a theological comprehension by starting with his understanding of Christ. He can now look at this scene and see her as the embodiment of Christ. So to theologize is not to speak about God in the way that other ologies speak about their own subject. Theology is to see with a transformed vision and a transforming vision. The way theology is used in the early church is, a is as a transitive verb. They theologize Christ, and Irenaeus is theologizing Blandina here. And then finally, the fourth thing to note about it is that, in fact, we are the ones today who, through Irenaeus's words, are able to look at Blandina and see her as an image of Christ. In the way that had we been a Roman citizen enjoying the games on that day, we would not have done so. Just like it's only through the opening of scriptures and the breaking of the bread, not by physically being on the road to Emmaus, that the disciples were able to recognize the risen Christ. Then it finally it carries on. Through their continued life, so this is now 45 to 46, the there refers to Blandina and uh, another boy who was killed alongside her called Attalus. Through their continued life, the dead were made alive, and the witnesses, the martyrs, showed favor to those who had failed to witness. And there was great joy for the virgin mother in receiving back alive those whom she had miscarried as dead. For through them, the majority of those who denied were again brought to birth, again conceived, and again brought to life, and learned to confess, and are living and strengthened, they went to their judgment seat. So there were some in the arena whose faith was not strong enough. They backed down, they turned away, and they are described as being dead, stillborn children. But through the continued life of Blandina and Attalus, which actually means their death as witnesses, um, the others were encouraged and strengthened to come back. And so there was great joy for the virgin mother receiving them back alive. She finally gives birth to living children as they go to the judgment seat. So the letter continues by saying how the, the, the death of the martyrs is in fact their true birthday. Okay, I mentioned that Blandina was technically a non-person in the ancient world. That she could have been thought of as being a non-person might seem to us to be inconceivable. And if it seems to us, you know, that a slave is technically a non-person, that's because of the presuppositions regarding the dignity and equality of all human beings that we have today. This is, of course, uh, the first self-evident truth declared by the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, that they're in, this is the first self-evident truth. All men are created equal, they're endowed with, by their creator with uncertain, unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in simile, a couple of centuries later, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. But the question here really is, is are these truths self-evident? Well, evidently not. It's not an empirical conclusion, nor is it even empirically verifiable. People are born in all sorts of different conditions, um, uh, still born into slavery. It's not an empirical conclusion. It's not empirically verifiable. 
in fact, it is an a priori assumption. In other words, it is in fact a statement of faith. Just as much as Irenaeus' description of Blandina as the embodiment of Christ is also a statement of faith. Moreover, as David Bentley Hart has argued, persuasively, vigorously, but then does David do anything less than vigorously, the process by which we've come to hold these truths as being self-evident is in fact the revolution that is Christianity. He points out that the gospel was a message of liberation for the ancient world such that we can barely begin to understand today largely because of the way that the gospel has changed our perception and in changing our perception has changed our reality to the point that we take it as a self-evident truth that all human beings are created equal, born free and equal in dignity. The gospel proclaims that Christ has, Christ has triumphed over the powers of the world. All the things to which human beings have subjected themselves but which Christ had shown to be nothing. His cross tamed the fearful world in which human beings had formerly lived, so that the world could, see, could be seen to be not an uh, a realm in which all sorts of unknown things and fates and gods and demons would ever work, but rather the whole world could be seen as a gratuitous expression of divine love, ex nihilo, a place of beauty and wonder, whose diversity reflects a very manifold splendor of God's own wisdom. And that the drama of salvation is enacted within the world, working backwards to the beginning and forwards to the eschaton, gives the whole of creation its time and its history, a meaning and an orientation. And more specifically, it's in this, this new world, created by the Christian revolution, that our notion of person emerges, especially in the debates about Christ himself. So he says, these are rather long quotations, We've got a couple of them um, that will bring me to the end of my talk. Uh, but the, you know, when you see David's writing, it's, it's striking writing. He says, the rather extraordinary inference to be drawn from this doctrine of Chalcedon is that personality is somehow transcendent of nature. A person is not merely a fragment of some larger cosmic or spiritual category, or more perfect or a more defective expression of some abstract set of attributes, in the light of which his or her value, significance, legitimacy, or proper place is to be judged. This man or that woman is not merely a specimen of the general set of the human, rather his or her human nature is only one manifestation and one part of what he or she is or might be. Personality is an irreducible mystery, somehow prior to and more spacious than everything that would delimit or define it, capable of exceeding even its own nature in order to embrace another ever more glorious nature. This immense dignity, this infinite capacity, inheres in every person, no matter what circumstances might for now seem to limit him or her to one destiny or another. No previous Western vision of the human being remotely resembles this one. No other so fruitfully succeeded in embracing at once the entire range of finite human nature in all the intricacy of its inner and outer dimensions, while simultaneously affirming the transcendent possibility and the strange grandeur present within each person. So the result of all of these de debates is to bring about a new understanding of the human being. He carries on. What resulted from this theological reflection is a coherent concept of the human as such, endowed with infinite dignity in all its individual moments, full of powers and mysteries to be fathomed and esteemed, and unimaginably exalted of a picture of the human person made in the image destined to partake of the divine nature, without thereby diminishing or denigrating the concrete reality of human nature, spiritual, intellectual, or carnal. So the gospel has brought about a very different way of looking at the world and looking at ourself. Now, of course, this didn't happen immediately, nor did every Christian society always live up to this calling. But he points out, it required an extraordinary moment of awakening in a few privileged souls. And then centuries of the relentless and total immersion of culture in the Christian story 
to make even the best of us conscious of, or at least able to believe in, the moral claim of all other persons upon us, the splendor and the irreducible dignity of the divine humanity within them, that depth within each of them that potentially touches the, upon the eternal. In the light of Christianity's absolute law of charity, we came to see what we formerly could not see. The autistic or the Down syndrome or otherwise disabled child, for instance, whom the for whom the world can remain a perpetual perplexity, which can too often cause pain, but perhaps only vaguely and fleetingly charm or delight. The derelict or the wretched or broken man or woman who's wasted his or her life away. The homeless, the utterly impoverished, the diseased, the mentally ill, the physically disabled, exiles, refuge, refugees, fugitives, even criminals and reprobates. To reject, turn away from, or kill any or all of them would be, in a very real sense, the most purely practical of impulses. To be able, however, to see in them not only something of worth, but indeed something potentially godlike, to be cherished and adored, is the rarest and most ennoblingly unrealistic capacity ever bred within human souls. To Look on the child whom our ancient ancestors would have seen as somehow unwholesome or as, worth, as a worthless burden and would have abandoned to fate and to see in him or her instead a person worthy of all affection, resplendent with divine glory, ominous with an absolute demand upon our consciences, evoking our love and our reverence, is to be set free from merely elemental existence and from those natural limitations that the pre-Christian persons took to be the very definition of reality. It really is the most remarkable and inspiring vision. But a vision which depends, as it were, upon this divine exchange, to see the divine strength in human weakness, to see life in death, to see the very word of God in flesh, is always going to appear a folly and a scandal for human thought. It will necessarily be a fragile vision and can all too easily be forgotten. So just as um, Jouvin finished his works with that provocative question, as did Geoffrey Bishop with his provocative question, can, maybe only theology can save medicine. Uh, David finishes his section with likewise a, qu uh, a provocative question. He says, how long can our gentler ethical prejudices, many of which seem to me to be melting away with fair rapidity, how can they persist once the faith that gave them their rationale and meaning has withered away? Love endures all things, perhaps, as the apostle says, and is eternal. But as a cultural reality, even love requires a reason for its preeminence among the virtues. And the mere habit of solicitude for others will not necessarily survive when that reason is no longer found. If, as I have argued, the human as we now understand it is a positive invention of Christianity, might it not also be the case that a culture that has become truly post-Christian will also ultimately become post-human. My question would be post-human, or perhaps given what I've shown, will it have lost its aspiration to become human, a task which is still ahead of us? The Christian gospel, as we've seen it reflected upon and lived out by the martyrs in the early centuries, did indeed proclaim a revolution, that Christ shows us what it is to be God, not as the Olympians of mythology and our infantile understandings of divinity, but he shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being. And even more remarkably, that in this way he also shows us what it is to be human, by turning our frailty, weakness, and ultimately death inside out to make to make this mortality frailty and weakness that in which his strength not our strength is made perfect so bringing to completion the very project of god himself 
to make a human being in his image and likeness as we give our let it be to God's own project. This really is, I think, the most profound understanding of what it is to be human that I've come across, and it's most pithily expressed by the letter of Barnabas, which I, I think this is the best definition of the human being altogether. The human being is earth that suffers. It's this vision, and this vision alone, that enables us to assert that despite all the evidence before our eyes, or rather because of our transformed vision in the light of Christ, it's this vision and this vision alone that enables us to assert that those who would not otherwise even be counted as persons are in fact truly human, and perhaps even more so in their weakness than we in our apparent strength and security, where we think we're going to live forever because medicine will always fix it. But having eradicated, or all but eradicated, death from the horizon of our daily life, so that we no longer see death, our horizon has now become much more restricted and turned in upon itself as purely imminent. What we call life is in reality no more than the motion of dead matter, dead bodies, as, as Bishop puts it. No matter how long we perpetuate its functioning, it is dead matter in motion. Our bodies have become plastic to our own whims, rather than the place in which we experience what it is to be human, earth that suffers, clay being molded through the course of our life. And through that experience of suffering, enter into the life that comes about through suffering and death, becoming in the end human, as God himself has shown this to be, and shown himself to be. So can there be a human being when death is not seen in all the dimensions I spoke about it earlier, that whole liturgy I spoke about in this particular Western context? Can we even see God when we no longer see death? If Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, if we don't see that liturgy of death and participate in it, can we even see God? So those are the questions that lie before us. Can we see being human as something that we are called to and as that which God has shown himself to be in Christ? Or are we going to aspire instead to what we think it is to be God's and so to live with Calypso and the Olympians and so bring our story to an end? And yet there is still hope that we can still learn to aspire to become human because no matter how much we project our aspirations elsewhere, we will still suffer and we will still die. Going back to that quotation from Herve Juvin, alone the body remembers uh, that it is finite. Alone it roots us in its limits, our last frontier. And even if, especially if, it forgets, the body alone still prevents us from being God to ourselves and to others. Okay, when I read it there, I missed out those words, because those words are perhaps the most provocative of all. For how long? Thank you. <laughs>